So we're just going to start basically with a simple definition. All right, what is executive function? It is the brain's ability to access and coordinate, two key words, access and coordinate, <coughs> the cognitive and emotional processes, emotion is a major part of executive function, um, the cognitive and emotional processes to achieve a goal. All right, in short, what executive function is, is goal-oriented behavior. So one of the things that happens, particularly if you have a child or you have students who struggle with some of these, uh, one of the things that always drives me crazy in school, you'll hear teachers say, oh, well, he's an executive function kid. And it makes me a little crazy because we all have executive function. And we all have problems with it sometimes. <laughs> uh, and so it, this definition is important because it covers Achieving a goal is everything we do, from the time we wake up in the morning and get out of bed when our alarm clock goes off, to the time we fall asleep at night, our executive function is engaged. <coughs> and all of our behavior is goal-oriented, um, either consciously or sometimes unconsciously, some of our routine behaviors we don't even think about. So um, the cognitive and emotional process is to achieve a goal. So what does that mean? Uh, and I'll just point out up here that I, I have a bunch of pictures up here because executive function does not just have to do with school. It's everything. So I get the A on the paper there. Yes, to get an A, you have to have pretty good, solid executive skills. Um, that are working in the classroom. You also have to have a lot of other skills as well. But the same thing is true if you have some physical challenge, like the guy climbing the mountain, um, or that picture up on the top. I don't know if North Carolina is destination imagination, but this is a group. This is my son jumping up in the air on the left when he was little, but that was his little group. And I stuck that up there because that took enormous executive functioning skills um, and kids working together to you know, solve a problem, create a goal, uh, create a project, and, and, and actually produce a performance um, in order to compete in, in this uh, activity of destination imagination. <coughs> um, <clears throat> Those are all very complex goals, all right, but executive function also is required to take a shower, right, tie your shoes, brush your teeth, get dressed, a lot of the things that we do um, almost without thinking uh, on a regular basis. Um, an analogy for executive function, in case that definition was too wordy, uh, is <coughs> that it is to the brain what a conductor is to a symphony orchestra. So if you go and you watch a production of music, you could have a collection of musicians sitting on that stage who are the best musicians in the world at what they do. The top cellist, the top violinist, the top percussionist, the top um, oboist. Uh, is that what you say? Oboist? Oboe player? Oboist. <laughs> uh, Yet, if the conductor is not fully trained and engaged and able to access all of the power that's out there and coordinate it, the performance is not going to be top notch. The individual musicians and the sections might be top notch, but they all have to work together and regulate be regulated and coordinated by the conductor so that the strings come in at just the right time, um, so that the tempo stays on pace, so that the pauses happen where they're supposed to, so the volume changes as the, the um, composer indicated that it should. Um, and so your executive function does that. It's that access. It takes the different parts of your brain the cognitive and emotional processes. So attention is one of those. All right, attention is different from executive function. It's one of the facets of executive function. Your executive function is what helps you manage your attention. Uh, <coughs> another is memory. All right, your executive, your memory is a separate system. It's a cognitive system. It's also part of your emotional system. 
uh, and your executive function coordinates it, accesses memory, and it coordinates it to pull it together in order to achieve what you need to achieve. So it's a very complex uh, type of thing, and, um, and that's why I use this analogy because I th it helps me actually picture what's happening in the brain. Um, and a lot of people, when they talk about executive function, they do this. <laughs> Right? Um, part of that is because <coughs> your executive function is primarily located in the frontal lobes of your brain. Uh, although it's a misnomer that that's where it is, executive function actually involves the entire brain. Um, but the coordinating processes and the goal-oriented, um, having a goal and staying focused on a goal happens in your, um, in your frontal lobes. So we're going to do two things. We're going to talk about here on this slide goal-oriented behaviors, and then we're going to talk about goal-oriented attitudes. All right? Um, and I want you to just think about the behaviors, all right? Um, I have the pictures at the top. One is tying a shoe, and the other is tying a monkey's paw, monkey's fist. Anybody ever made a monkey's fist? It's got to be one of the most frustrating things I've ever done. I'm a sailor, and I have two kids, and we go on these long sailing cruises in the summer. In fact, we're leaving this weekend for, for two and a half weeks. And um, so, oh, this was going to be brilliant, right? I brought on the boat with me all of this string and little instructions so that we could tie monkey's fists and make keychains, you know, for the family for Christmas presents. Well, you know, after screaming and tears, and it was a total disaster. It's really hard to do this. <laughs> and yet, they're both physical skills, right? Tying a shoe, tying a monkey's fist. One is something that we've developed automaticity with. You know, once we hit what, I don't know, by second grade usually, kids are generally able to tie their shoes pretty well. Um, it's become a routine, it's become automatic. Um, so that goal, when you get dressed in the morning, that tying your shoes, um, when, when a child is three years old or four years old, Tying a shoe is as complicated as making a monkey's fist for any of us who haven't done it before. Because why? Because they haven't done it. They're learning the skill. They have to learn the skills to do it. The skill has to become a routine and they develop automaticity. So what do we do as parents with our kids? We teach them strategies. Anybody teach their kid the bunny ears? You know, make a loop, make the two bunny ears, cross them over, go through. That's one of the strategies. There are a couple different ways to tie your shoes. That's a really popular way. So what we've done as parents is we've identified something that our children need to know how to do, a behavior that they need to have accomplished. We teach them a strategy to accomplish that behavior. And then we practice it with them. And we practice it, and we practice it, and we practice it. And sometimes we get frustrated and we're in a hurry. We say, I'm just going to tie your shoe for you, right? <laughs> because it's a lot faster that way. Um, the more we do that, the less practice the kids get. Uh, you can substitute tying your shoes for, you can substitute for tying your shoes a lot of different things. Same thing, again, from a parent point of view, thinking of children. Um, you teach your children how to brush their teeth when they're young. Right. These are things that have become now, as they, as they get older and as you become an adult, they're automatic. You don't really think about it. Um, and, um, and yet, when we're working with young kids as parents, uh, we are their teachers. And we're modeling for them. Here's how you do it. You know, let me show you a strategy. And there's all kinds of strategies that you, you know, you often don't, you're not even really thinking about it that way, um, but, but that's what you're doing. The bunny ears on the shoes, the, you know, drawing little circles on your teeth, you know, to be able to brush the teeth. How you, um, how you make your bed, right? That's another one. How to clean up your room. Um, lots of these things we actually <laughs> teach our children to do. We have an expectation or a goal of what students are, what, what see, they're students, I've been talking about students all day, what our kids are, are, need to be able to do, uh, what they need to know in order to do it, and then we teach them strategies, and we practice and practice and practice, and we harass them and harass them and harass them, um, and then what we hope is what? That eventually they'll 
do it themselves, that it becomes routine, it becomes part of their regular practice, and, um, and they don't have to think about it so much anymore. Their minds are just kind of freed up to do other things because it's not a big, it's not a big deal. Um, reading, decoding words on a page is a routine. Uh, and we teach kids how to read when they're young. And eventually that activity of decoding words on a page becomes automatic. It's an automatic routine. The comprehension isn't automatic. Um, that's, a, that's sort of a, that's a different process, but the actual decoding of words on a page is another automatic routine. And, you know, if we had time right now, I might have you sit down and list, you know, what are ten things that you do in your life that you don't even think about as being goal-oriented behavior? And you'd probably be able to generate that pretty darn quickly once you start thinking about it like that. Um, other goals and goal-oriented behavior is complicated. All right, so give me an example. What would be, for a, a kid, what would be a complicated goal that really does require knowledge and planning and strategies and self-monitoring in order to achieve it? Can somebody give me an example? How to study for a test. Okay, studying for a test, absolutely. How to do it? What do I need to know? How do I actually remember this? What materials do I need? It's a, it's a big production and it's not always routine because often our, our kids are not taught how to do these things in school. The, the often educators sort of expect that they know how to do it. Um, and if the child doesn't have strategies, and often they're not willing to listen to our strategies <laughs> to help them, um, it, it, can be, it can be really overwhelming and, and it cause a lot of problems. What's another, um, what's another example of a complicated goal that... Managing homework. Okay, managing homework and, and time management and um, you know, how do you prioritize um, to get everything done. You know, I'm playing a sport after school, I gotta have family dinner, I wanna text my friends, but I have all this work to do. How, how do I manage my time to make sure that all gets done? You had your hand up too. Being a part of a team sport. Yes, being a part of a team sport. Because, wow, I mean, that's like that destination imagination. Suddenly it's beyond just yourself and something that you have to do. And not only do you have to know the rules of the game and be prepared with all your stuff, but you also have to be focused on um, where people are on the field and how you're supposed to behave, what the coach's expectations are. You have to manage the, the pressure right, of a competitive sport, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and often the goals are a little fuzzy when you're on a team sport. What is the, is the goal only to win? You know, or is the goal to demonstrate really good sportsmanship? Or is the goal to show off the new skills that you've learned? Uh, so, so that's a very complex activity. So executive function helps us coordinate <coughs> both automatic, routine, goal-oriented behaviors and also complex goal-oriented behaviors. But that's not it. It's not just the behaviors uh, that allow us to achieve a goal. It's also the attitudes. And if you think about your own life or you think you watch your kids, um, it's success that really motivates kids and drives them to be willing to take on new challenges. Uh, and the irony is that so often, both in school and, and at home, in the culture that we live in now, we push kids so hard and so fast that they never feel like they're successful. Um, and that has become a real problem. And there's a lot of literature out there about um, children who are, um, you know, overstressed at living these pressure cooker lives. In fact, we just, at, in our summer institute at Landmark last week, we had a gentleman named Michael Thompson, who's a psychologist, um, and he did a double session and 
the afternoon session was called The Pressured Child. Um, and, he taught, and he's wonderful. If you've never read Michael Thompson and you're a teacher or a parent, I would highly recommend that you get a hold of, of some of his books or, or if you have an opportunity s to see him. He's a, a wonderful speaker. Um, he does talk a lot about boys. That's sort of his specialty. Um, but, um, but there's a lot to learn, even if you're a teacher or a parent of, of girls. Um, so goal-oriented attitudes are equally important to the behaviors. Um, when we are successful at something, it layers into our memories the fact that we were successful. So for instance, just to go back to the shoe tie, and you're a little kid, and you have worked really, really hard to learn how to tie your shoes. You are goal-oriented. Yes, your parents want you, to want, want you to learn how to tie your shoes, but you do too, because you want to be independent, right? And it, you want to do it yourself. And you see these little kids going, no, I do it, right? <laughs> um, because that's that drive to independence. They don't want to have somebody else do it for them. And they get very frustrated if we rush them or if we criticize them while they're trying. Okay? And I, I'm using this as an example because I want you to think of other things, too. I mean, it's, so if we rush them too hard, if we criticize them, or if we get frustrated, say, just do it. You know, I showed you how to do it. And we, or we don't give them the cues that they need. Um, they, they're going to get frustrated. They might freak out. They might give up. Um, they might demand Velcro shoes or slip-on shoes. <laughs> um, and they may start to avoid the task altogether which means that they don't get the practice. And then there's very little, ultimately, you know, little desire to actually learn it because they don't think they can. Um, and so it's really important, whether it's tying shoes or reading or learning how to study for a vocabulary test or writing an essay or a research paper or a college application, whatever it is, it's really important that we think about the absolute essential aspect of ex experiencing some success and providing our students or our children with many, many opportunities for success. Um, the research shows that individuals who develop confidence and a feeling that you know, they can be successful and they had some experiences of success in meeting challenges um, are far more likely to persist longer in the face of frustration or challenge, um, to stick to it, to try different things to achieve the goal. There's a willingness to be flexible. Um, all those things that we want our students and our children to develop, that we want to develop for ourselves <laughs> as well, uh, are founded on really being focused on, ha on having some experiences with success. <clears throat> so the question is always, well, don't we want our children to learn how to fail? Well, yes and no. Um, you know, they're going to have plenty of opportunities to fail in their lives. Um, and particularly as parents, we want to try to give them as many opportunities to succeed as they can. Uh, because when they're faced with a challenging goal, something that's really difficult for them, um, you know, they may not do it perfectly. And to a lot of kids, that's a failure, right? They may get a B when they had really worked hard and tried to get an A. Um, and that's an opportunity for us as parents and also as teachers to talk to them. Well, how'd you feel about this? Well, what strategies did you use? You know, um, do you have to get an A always? Um, what's going on with that? And let's really kind of talk about the attitudes that are wrapped up in how we respond as individuals to the process of working toward a goal. Um, because really the goal is we are trying to help our kids develop this, um, you know, a, a persistence with motivation and with effort and with flexible thinking about how to achieve a goal. And once you get frustrated, and I'm going to show you another slide that's about a failure cycle, but once you get frustrated, it's much harder 
to get back on track. What can we do as parents <coughs> to develop goal-oriented attitudes? Um, we can provide as many opportunities for success as we can. There's a very well-known speaker, uh, Rick Lavoie, who talks about students with learning disabilities, and he talks to groups of parents and groups of teachers, and he talks about um, the relationship of success and motivation. Most of us are highly motivated by success. Um, there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, well, you know, that was too easy. We have to set the bar higher. We have to make them reach and struggle, right? Push them, push them, push them. That's not enough challenge. Well, you know what? The only people that that's going to motivate are the ones who are likely to be able to achieve that next and higher level. A lot of us would just, you know, sort of just give up if the bar is set too high. You know, there's no way I can do that. Um, and so we need to give kids opportunities for success. And Rick Lavoie says, if the only thing that your child is really good at is using a screwdriver, like to, you know, tighten things up and screw things in, and, 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 and he said, then, you know what? I'm going to come home from work early, and I'm going to unscrew a whole bunch of things in the house. And I'm going to ask my kid, hey, I could use a hand. Would you grab the screwdriver and tighten up this doorknob for me? It, that is providing an opportunity for success. It's an extreme example, but it's a really good example because our kids need this to develop really good executive function skills. Um, so I said I'd show you this. This is a failure cycle, and this was actually um, put together. Landmark School, which is the associated with our or I guess our outreach program is associated with the school, has a group of students called the Student Advocates. And they go out and they talk to groups of people. They're kids who have been at Landmark for a while and um, are highly self-aware in terms of their own learning styles and um, wh what they need in order to be successful. And they go and they talk to groups of teachers um, about learning disabilities and what it's like to, to be a student um, with learning disabilities. And this was put together by um, a group of them and uh, called the failure cycle. And I just want you to see this because as we talk about executive function, uh, one of the things that happens is that people assume, sometimes parents, sometimes teachers, uh, that a lot of these students who are struggling are not motivated. And that's it's, that's wrong, because motivation comes way late in the cycle. Um, and so I just want you to take a look at this and see. Um, the cycle starts with whatever the task is. We make an attempt. Okay, say it's me. I make an attempt at the task. All right? If I fail at that task for whatever reason, and we'll talk about lots of different reasons why you might fail at a task. If I fail at that task, uh, <clears throat> what happens is I get frustrated. And if, that, if this process isn't interrupted right there by somebody who can help me break out of it and get out of that cycle so that I can go back and make some more attempts, um, if that cycle isn't broken, I move from frustration to avoidance. All right, these are the kids in the classroom who go to the bathroom when it's reading time, who ask to get a drink of water when it's time to do their, you know, um, math facts, anything. They're the kids who, um, you know, throw paper clips at their neighbors so that they'll get in trouble, so that they'll be sent out of the room. Anything. They will do anything to, to, to try to avoid a test. They'll get sick. They're the ones who have stomach aches in the morning, right? And I don't want to go to school today. Uh, that's this avoidance behavior. And once you start getting into this part of the cycle, it gets much harder to break the cycle. Um, and because the next piece is as you start to avoid, and I'm going to give you a very specific example, all right? Um, in a, a third grade classroom, the kids were meant to learn their math facts, practice their math facts. Uh, and the teacher, fabulous teacher, very interactive, wonderful guy, um, and says, um, says, I have never had a third grader who's finished the year, you know, not being able to do their multiplication facts, a hundred multiplication facts in two minutes. I've never had this happen. 
And, uh, and so he has the whole theme for the year is ancient history. So there are these like gladiators on the wall. And as the students uh, in the third grade, once they, they get through their addition facts in you know, the mad minute and they get a shield and they get through the, you know, or no, they do the multiplication facts first. They get a shield once they've done the multiplication facts. And then they do, um, they move from multiplication to division. And when they get their division facts all memorized, then they get a sword. And then they have to go back and show they can do the addition and the subtraction. They get, you know, the crown and they all these, you know, decorated gladiators, fabulous big things on the walls. And um, I went into the classroom and I saw that there were two gladiators who were naked. <coughs> and um, no, no nothing. And so I talked to the teacher and, um, and well, you know, this is, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, but you know, the, these two little boys need to practice more and they need to do it at home. And to make a long story short, what happened to these two little boys, and this is a fabulous teacher, but what happened, because of the way the lesson, the, the whole project was set up, these two little boys got to the end of the year and eventually the teacher was panicked because he had never had kids not be able to do this and he started doing it um, orally and then he started having them come like every day to keep, I mean he was just, and, and I will say that on the last day of school, well one little boy did it like in May the other little boy did it on the last day of school. It had to do it orally, because you know, trying to take the time away from the writing. But because of the setup of the task and the goal, uh, and these kids got stuck um, on this um, the, the constant failed attempt, the frustration, the avoidance. There were behavior problems that were going on with this. Um, we got down into this part, the lack of practice. So what happened to these two little boys? They practiced their multiplication facts a lot because they, were, they kept at it, they kept at it. But that was only to get the shield. And they ended up getting out of third grade without ever practicing their division facts. And they went to fourth grade with absolutely no division memory at all. And so we're way behind um, where they needed to be. And that's a problem because then there's no improvement and when you sense, and kids do from a very young age, that you're not as good or as able as other kids in the class, um, you lose your sense of self-esteem. And your self-esteem is, is one of our basic human psychological needs, um, is a need for the esteem of others and the respect of others. Um, and when you lose that, uh, because kids are mean and nasty, um, and um, when you lose that, then you start to lose your motivation and to give up, all right? And then we get, and that's, and see how late in that cycle? And so we as parents and as teachers need to recognize when it's happening way up here. Um, and, and, you know, teachers always ask me, and they ask today, you know, isn't it good to fail? Well, yes and no. Um, not too much, please, <laughs> because we really need to, to make sure that students know that it's worth attempting and that most of the time that they're going to be successful. Uh, <coughs> or at least if we intervene in here, we talk about why, like to go back to what you were saying. So, okay, so let's use this as a learning opportunity. What didn't work? You know, and make it into a, a positive experience so that they can go back and make another attempt and they can get up here in this cycle rather than going all the way down to here. Because the last thing that happens is something that's called the Matthew effect. And this is talked about in reading a lot, um, but it's true in, in any sort of skill development. And that is, and it comes from the, um, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, they talk about the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Uh, and this is a common conversation in school because what happens is from a very young age the students who come in and they learn to read pretty quickly and they learn to like reading right they're successful at it it becomes automatic so it's not as grueling um, it becomes enjoyable so they start to be able to decode the words and so they can focus on the story and and not really be focused on sounding out each word and enjoy the story and get into it and they like it so they read more and the more they read 
what happens, the better their skills get, gets automatic. And so they're on a curve of improvement that goes like that. Then you have the kids who come in and they get lots of instruction and they're just, it's not happening for them, right? They're, um, they're really struggling and they see, they see their friends reading Harry Potter in second grade and they're still working on like, you know, Mac and Tab. Um, and, and they know that and they are highly aware of that and they're working hard and they want to do it because of course they want to read. I mean, you get a lot of kids in, in the elementary grades who say that they're reading books and they're not. They're not reading, they're pretending because they want to be like all their friends, um, but they're not reading them. Uh, and so what the Matthew effect is, hap what happens is those kids, these kids are on an improvement scale like this, whether it's math facts or writing or reading, and the kids who are struggling if they're recognized, if they're not recognized, they're just, they're just going to flatline and, and the gap gets bigger and bigger as time goes on. What we see happening a lot in schools is you've got these kids doing this and getting better all the time and you get these kids who are getting identified earlier now, which is great, you know, because teachers have much more um, understanding and access of language-based learning disabilities and so the kids get intervention and they're getting the intervention and they're improving, right? And, and the parents sit at the IEP meetings and the teachers say, yep, you know, they're making improvements. But the problem is this group of kids, all their peers are on this slope and these children are improving but they're, they're on a different slope. And as time goes by, the gaps get wider and the other, the other kids are just getting left further and further behind. So when we talk about reading intervention, we talk about how important it is to do assessments and to make sure that when we're monitoring students' progress in reading, that the slope of improvement is one that is going to close that gap um, in, a, in a, you know, as short a time as possible. Uh, and that's what the Matthew effect is. Um, so the poor readers, what happens is they don't like to read, so they avoid it, right? And, um, you know, they watch the movie, right? Or they have someone read to them, and the more they avoid it, the less practice they get, the less practice they get, the less they improve, and it's this whole cycle um, that, is, um, that is, affects their behavior and their emotion. <clears throat> so we're going to revisit executive function. Um, these are six facets of executive function. What does it involve? Uh, different researchers out there have lots of different formulations about what the facets of executive function are. I really like uh, Thomas Brown, Dr. Thomas E. Brown, and I stuck his, it's kind of tiny down there, but uh, I really like him. He's at Yale. And he is one of the most cogent writers. If you have children or students who have attention deficit disorder or, or um, executive function issues, um, I would really take a look at his stuff, um, particularly if, or recommend it to parents. If anyone's struggling with medication or not medication, things like that, he gives a really clear explanation of how medication works in the brain that I don't have time to talk about right now, but, it, but it's quite good. And he has a really good website that's www.drthomasebrown.com. Uh, and it's, it's a good, robust site. There's lots of stuff on it I would recommend. Um, but he's kind of nailed it down to six facets. Um, there's another uh, theorist who has something like 14. There's another one that's got like 22. There's another one that's got 28. Uh, I stuck with Dr. Thomas E. Brown because I like the simplicity and you can remember these things and they all make sense. Um, I think uh, it, you can hold, we, we're known, our, our memories, our working memory can hold about seven things in it at one time. Um, and there's only six here. <laughs> so I like that. Uh, so what are they? Um, and they, if you remember when you came in and you looked at the title slide, it had the cogs on the wheel. Um, and those words on that were the same as here. This is not a hierarchy, all right? It's in a list because it's easy to read this way. 
these things all work simultaneously and they drive each other. Uh, what are they? Activation, right? Initiating, prioritizing, getting organized. Uh, focus, uh, focusing our attention. Not just focusing, but sustaining it uh, and shifting it as is required. <coughs> effort, regulating our alertness and sustaining our effort and speed. That's very difficult. Um, and we often see kids who they start out great guns and then they just run out of steam, right? Um, and, and that is an executive function issue. Um, emotion, managing frustration, modulating emotions. Uh, students who struggle with executive function have a really hard time with this um, because when, when you have weaknesses in your executive functions, a lot of things that seem kind of just run of the mill for people who don't have weaknesses in this area um, are completely overwhelming for students who have learning disabilities and attention deficit disorders. Um, and, and so they get very frustrated. So you'll see kids, the, the child, some children, like that little boy, and they look, they might not even try the first problem. They just look at the piece of paper and they might pick it up and rip it in half. Or they might scrunch it up and run out the door crying. You know, I mean, and, and that's, they're in that failure cycle, um, deep into it, of avoidance, you know, anything to, to prevent myself from failing yet again. Um, memory is another aspect of executive function, using working memory and accessing recall. Um, and, and in the memory part, that's remembering strategies, right? Go back to the shoe tying, right? A child learning how to tie the shoe has to access memory. Oh yeah, I have to make two loops that look like bunny ears, right? That's, that's accessing memory. Um, and action. Monitoring and self-regulating action. Does this look right? You know, tying my shoe, okay, I did the strategy, but wait a minute, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. Wait, I better go back and try this again. Right, that's your executive function. You think about that with lots of tasks that you're doing. If you're cooking dinner, for example, you're trying a new recipe, and you're looking at it in the pan, and you're thinking, hmm. That doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look like the picture, you know? Uh, what did I do here? Or what can I do to try to salvage this situation? Uh, and and that, that's an example of monitoring action and sort of trying to shift strategies. So these are six facets that you can think of um, as you're thinking about kids and yourselves, too, uh, with your executive skills. So when and how does it develop? It begins at birth. As soon as children are born, their neural networks in their brains start hooking up and making connections uh, with goal-oriented behavior. And I used the example this morning. A young infant, uh, very young, they begin to learn what signals, what communication to use to get what they need because they're hungry or they're uncomfortable or something like, or they want, you know, they want somebody to hold them. Uh, and, and if they're successful, okay, the infant cries, the mom or the dad or whoever it is, you know, picks them up and cuddles them and they still cry, then they give them the bottle. They've been successful at, at their communicative activity of, of advocating for themselves and what they need. Um, if it does happen, they start to go into the failure cycle. Uh, and so it can be as simple as that. Uh, so executive function begins at birth. It surges during puberty um, for all kinds of neurological reasons when the, um, the myelination on the axons of the brain cells increases and we often see a, a major surge of um, improvement in goal-oriented behavior and attitudes during puberty. Uh, and, and it develops through late adolescence, which goes well beyond the 18-year-old age. Um, adolescence really doesn't technically end until 24, 25 years old, uh, sometimes later. <laughs> and, um, and it declines with age. And I put a little asterisk on that, because uh, I'm talking to lots of people who are my age tonight who might be feeling it. But uh, one of the things, I mean, we all notice if you have aging relatives, you, you can see, and you can even see it in yourself, sometimes a decline in 
holding it all together. We're a little more easily overwhelmed the older that we get. Um, but the more routines we have, the more successful we are. And it's why sometimes when you see very elderly people um, are kind of rigid about their routines, um, there's a reason for that, because that's what's sustaining them. Uh, and they have, they have their routines. And when something disrupts those routines, right, if they have a fall or they get sick or, you know, some, if something disrupts those routines, sometimes it can just tip the balance and, and you have all kinds of other, other problems. So routines sustain us. And anything that we can do to help our kids develop good, healthy, productive routines uh, is going to help them develop their executive skills. What are some of the points that can interfere with goal achievement? And in this case, it doesn't matter what the goal is, whatever the goal is, where, where can things go wrong? And whether you're a parent or a teacher looking at, or, or, or just you know, examining your own goal-oriented behavior, right? let's say you decide you're going to train to run a marathon, right? well, you know, to be conscious of you know, where things can start to fall apart. Because many of us set goals for ourselves and then we don't achieve them. And we ourselves get into that failure cycle. You know, losing weight is another one. Um, starting any kind of exercise routine, um, starting a different kind of a diet, you know, um, being a vegetarian, whatever it is. Uh, and if you're conscious of all the places where things might go wrong, um, sometimes you can prevent it from happening. Or if you're working with students um, or children who are experiencing difficulties, here's a place that you can really sit down and try to figure out with them where are things just not working? Um, my colleague Ann talks about click and clunk. You know, you can talk to kids, when does it click and when, is it, when does it clunk? Uh, and get them actually talking about um, where things are going wrong, what's working, what's not. So here we go, I have a goal. First of all, we gotta have a plan, right? That's part of it, it's the goal setting piece, all right? Um, part of the plan is, I know what to do. All right, so let's just take, for example, that you're going to train for a marathon. All right, well, you've got to have a plan. Well, when's the marathon, first of all? You know, is this a reasonable plan? Is the marathon next week? <laughs> you know, have you never run before? Maybe we need to shift that goal. Um, but, but we have a plan. Um, I know what to do. You know, do you know how to train? To, to run long distances. Um, what are the steps? What do you need to be careful of? You know, you need to go see a doctor first and make sure that your body is all right to start a training routine, for example. Um, I know how to do it. Do you know how to stretch properly as a runner? Right? Do you know what equipment you need? Do you know what the difference is between running shoes and, you know, aerobic shoes? Um, just, I'm just throwing out some examples to you, but um, so you need to have a plan, you need to know what to do, and you need to know how to do it. Anything can go wrong in e even these very beginning stages of goal orientation. If, you, if the goal is, is um, if the bar is too high or it's too complicated based on what you can do right now, you, you're not going to succeed. I mean, if you don't know what to do, think about how often kids fail in school because the directions weren't clear or they didn't really understand what they were supposed to do, um, or how many don't know how to do it. Um, the teacher asks them to complete an assignment and they, they, they don't know how. Either, either they can't read it, right, or they don't know how to put together an essay or a paragraph, something like that. They're going to they're gonna fail right there at their attempt because they don't have the skills to be able to do it. Um, the next one, I begin. Because what happens sometimes, and particularly with kids who have executive function issues, sometimes they have this. They got the plan, they know what to do, and they know how to do it. But that initiation piece is really hard. So did you just not start? Did you procrastinate? Right? A huge problem 
for, for students um, with uh, ADHD and learning disabilities and executive function uh, is, is getting over procrastinating. Uh, you get started, you work through each step. Did you go through things step by step? Did you follow your plan? Or did you skip steps? Right? Think about the people training for the marathon and they're in a rush and they don't stretch and they go for a run and they pull their Achilles tendon. Guess what? Their goal isn't going to happen or it's going to be, it's going to have to be put off. You know, so where, where did things go wrong? Um, the next one, I recognize and adjust to difficulty. Some of our kids are able to go through all these steps quite successfully and they start working through, the, through each step and then they run into a problem. And then everything falls apart because they get frustrated and they, lose, they just don't want to do it anymore. Um, <coughs> so they need to be able to recognize and adjust to difficulty and then they need to complete it. So again, let's say um, you've trained for the marathon, you've done all of that, did you actually run the marathon? Because what happens sometimes, and there's all different reasons that can happen, sometimes at the very end people freak out and they don't want to do it. I know lots of students who don't want to turn in their papers. They've written the whole paper and they don't want to turn it in because they, now they've put so much work into it and they're afraid to turn it in because they're, still, they're afraid they're not going to be successful. Um, that's a different problem than the kid who goes through all this and they finish all their homework and they just don't turn it in because they're so disorganized that it ends up at the bottom of the backpack or they left it at home, right? Two really different issues, right? Um, and it's important to figure out if, if I didn't complete the task, why? You know, did something go wrong all along here? Or did you get all the way up to here and what, you know, why didn't it come to fruition? Um, and then the last piece, which is really important, is often left off because often the goal is the last thing and it can't be because if we want to develop executive function skills in our students and in ourselves, we need to take the time to reflect on what worked. Okay? If I got all the way through this and I completed the task, and I achieved some level of success at my goal, then I need to be really conscious of what strategies did I use that worked for me. So that the next time I take on a goal, I've learned from that and I can pull on those strategies again. <laughs>